our chair and then find a copy of the scriptures and open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and we're going to pick up and run as fast as we can, beginning in verse 45. Mark 6, verse 45 is where we're going to begin today. So thankful for you all being here at our 8 a.m. service. Welcome to our online watchers. Also, we have a service at 10 and 12 if you want to come join us in person. It is radical to be here. How's everyone doing this morning? Are you guys fired up? We're like in the middle of August, just enjoying life. I'm so thankful to be here. If you guys go to South Beach Church, you know that last week I wasn't here. I took a little vacation with my family. People have been asking, Luke, how was your vacation? And then my mind just begins to wander. And uh, It was so, so good. So thank you so much for the privilege of leaving. My family and I had an opportunity to go to Hawaii for a couple days, and so it was radical. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for Pastor Rory filling in the pulpit so well. Can we Thank God for Pastor Rory. And while Pastor Rory filled in the pulpit, there is so many other staff and volunteers that just keep things going here at South Beach Church, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week as well. We have such a radical host of men and women who just say yes to whatever God puts upon their hearts. And you guys know, we're all gifted and skilled differently. We all have different experiences and we're created and crafted by God differently. And as I get older in the Lord, I celebrate this more and more and more. You're very familiar with yourself and your giftings and the way you think and you see a color and describe it one way or a flavor and somebody else has a completely different experience. God did all that on purpose and he made you exactly how you're supposed to be. Oh, what a joy when you figure that out. When you get over your identity crisis and who you're not or who the person next to you thinks you are, they're not even thinking about you, by the way. They're thinking about themselves And when we realize, Lord, thank you for making me this way, and thank you for my brothers and sisters and the way we're beautifully crafted and so wonderful. So I'm glad to be back. We're gonna get into Mark chapter six in just a few minutes. We've got some announcements, though, because as I mentioned, we don't just gather on Sundays at 8, 10, 12. We also gather throughout the week. It's summer, so the schedule's a little bit all over the place. Tomorrow night's Monday. Normally, there's a young adult group, but tomorrow night, the young adult group's not meeting because they're heading over, at least the dudes are, to Calvary Corvallis. Tomorrow is the third and final last stake and study of the year at Calvary Corvallis. So that's at 6 p.m. right over the hill. 15 bucks gets you a prime rib dinner with potatoes and all the fixings. Outdoor beautiful amphitheater with baptisms afterward. Daniel Fox, my really good friend, is giving the message tomorrow night. He's actually in Corvallis this morning giving the Sunday message there. So, so thankful for our partnership. Daniel Fox is the lead pastor at Riverview Christian Fellowship down in Coos Bay. And so be that as it may, guys, put it on your calendar head over there, find another dude, say, hey, are you going, are you going, can you give me a ride, you know, and you know, give him five bucks for gas, or five bucks won't get you past Toledo anymore, but, you know, p- pray for him, anyways, figure it out, that's tomorrow night, young adult group not happening, also, there is usually a Bible study at the FTK building, I'm not sure if they're going to postpone that for the FTK, or for the study, uh, then on Tuesday, we have CR, Wednesday, also, nothing going on this Wednesday, but in September, the ladies' ministry will begin back up with Bible studies as well as our women's night out. We'll give more detailed events or announcements about that as we get closer. Uh, The youth group is still meeting from time to time, middle schoolers and high schoolers, but they're on summer break. Thursday, we have the Hour of Power prayer session at the offices. Anywhere from 12 to 20 people are showing up just praying. If you can't be there from 7.30 to 8.30, that's understandable. Just show up for 10 minutes, pray, get out of there, get back to work, or pray at your home. But man, I'll tell you what, what the Bible says God loves those who love him and he blesses and honors those who seek him early in the morning. Proverbs tells us that. So, hey, join us there if you can make it at the offices by the bridge. Then on Friday, the FTK building again swells up and there is two Bible studies going on, one for discipleship with men, other dealing with end times and kind of world events, both at 6 p.m. there. I Failed to mention on Wednesdays at the FTK building, Ruby's in the Rough, that women's Bible study also meets at 5.30. So put that on your calendar. All that's happening right now. A few more announcements outside of the normal schedule. Send Back Sunday. We call it SBS. We love acronyms here at South Beach Church. At least I do. Everyone else just tolerates them. But SBS is happening here at South Beach Church on September 1st. So what we're going to do at the 8 a.m. and the 10 a.m. and the 12 p.m. is before the dismissal to Sunday school, we're going to invite 
invite everyone who's going back to school, whether they're preschool or kindergarten or going through senior high, they're gonna come up front, we're gonna pray for them. Not just the kids, but all the faculty and teachers and volunteers and bus drivers and coaches. We believe that the prayer covering of the church as we send our kids back, maybe it's homeschool, maybe it's charter, private, wherever they go to school, we want God to be in their lives and want them to know that the church loves them and supports them. Usually we have some fun activities in the classrooms afterwards, and we always try and give them some swag, a new t-shirt for them to wear to school on the first day. September 1st, SBS Send Back Sunday. That's putting on the calendar there for you guys, so make sure and show up for that day. Also, going through these announcements, uh, just a building, quick building update. Man, you guys know that this isn't our building, right? You guys, if you're visiting, this is a great building. Like, it's it's just a loner building. It's just a loner building. Such a rad loner building, though. This is week 27 in the Foursquare location. So grateful for God's provision for his church here in Newport, Oregon. Meanwhile, in South Beach, we're building a brand new facility, a 20,000 square foot brand new church facility. It's incredible to watch God provide and to lead us. And you guys who've been here from the beginning, you know it's been a long, over a decade in going. And so we're just trusting the Lord. So last July, I think July was last month, wasn't it? Like I left in July, came back in August. Anyways, July, we had someone approach us and say, we need to raise some money. I'm gonna donate up to $50,000 match campaign. Anything that comes in, I'll match it up to $50,000. And the total that came in for July towards that $50,000 match campaign was (laughs) $54,604. Uh, Isn't that cool? So in July, $54,000 came in on top of the $50,000 match on top of the $25,000 that we made at the garage sale. So July was a really good year, month. Now, one bag of concrete costs $120,000, okay? Just so you guys know, inflation has hit everywhere. Oh, I kid, but I don't kid. It's very, very expensive. And so here's what I want to do. I want to challenge you guys. We did this last year as well. We spent uh, August, September, October, November, December. We did our best to raise as much as we could during those last final months. And we asked people above and beyond their tithe and offering. Just keep doing that. But ask yourself, do it as a family. Hey, what can we afford to give? We're really trying to raise money and dig deep. Is there any, anything else we can afford right now? And I promise you, as you do this, it's unto the Lord. It's gonna be worship to him and he's gonna bless you beyond what you can imagine because that's what he promises to do. So pray about that. Wouldn't it be awesome if we, in the next month, actually the next two months, August and September, did the same thing? And here's why. Just recently, while I was gone on vacation, the plumbers were mobilized at the property. The pad is ready for concrete. The concrete, actually, the footings are gonna be poured hopefully by the 21st or so of August. That's coming up here real soon. But before any concrete goes in the ground, we have to put the underlaying utility and the infrastructure, the electrical and the plumbing and the gas and the low power, all that stuff. So the plumbers have been mobilized and they're trenching and digging all the water. It's a big, very expensive project. And I'll just let you guys know, we're gonna be very transparent as we move forward with the finances here at South Beach Church. Next week or in the weeks to come, we should have some infographics for you that show what we spent thus far and what things have cost and the projected cost of things in the future. So you kind of get an understanding of what we're dealing with, what we're trusting the Lord to do. But I'll just tell you, to get plumbing into the building, that's water from the street into the building, throughout the building, and then the next level of infrastructure after the concrete's there and the walls go up in the sinks and toilets and showers and all, all that stuff goes in. It's $191,000 just for the plumbing alone. So here's my challenge. What if we were to raise in the next month, August and September, $191,000 and just pay for the plumbing up front like that? We did this last year. We raised over $100,000 extra every single month when we prayed to the Lord and asked him how that might be possible. We can't one person do it, but we can all do it together. And I'm choosing to trust the Lord that for such a time as this, he's asked us to be a part of this, to dig down deep. And again, I promise you, take it up with the Lord between you and him. All the giving is between you and the Lord as you give faithfully. And he says, I see you. I gave it to you first. Don't forget that because he gave it all to us first, didn't he? And then he blesses us both body, mind, and spirit. So I just want that to be an update. Pray about it in the next two months. We're gonna try and we'll count and we'll see how that goes. So we're excited about what's happening though. And we're gonna trust the Lord for everything, are we not? As a matter of fact, today in the sermon, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Jesus miraculously provided last week, Pastor Rory taught us through the provision of the five loaves and two fish. How many of you guys know five loaves and two fish isn't enough? I just went to Hawaii there. A, a gallon of milk costs $300. 
Five loaves and two fishes, it's not enough. And Jesus, when he got the five loaves and two fishes, like, this is perfect. And he prayed, gave it back to them, made them organize and do the work. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And all of a sudden, there was more than they needed, and God provided over 5,000 meals. There was 5,000 men there, which means there were also women, not counted, but also numbered, and children. And Jesus, we're gonna see something today. He did that. He provided for them, but they kind of missed it. As a matter of fact, we're gonna learn from at the very end of today's sermon, but God provides, and I believe he's teaching us these lessons of his provision, because if you're honest, right now you can look at yourself and say, yeah, sheesh, he's been faithful to me every single step of my life. Whether you're like me and you're only 23 years old, 46, or maybe you're older than that. You're like, yeah, actually, you know, there's been some hard times. It hasn't always been easy because it's not supposed to always be easy. But he has been faithful every single time. And you need to believe this, that he's gonna continue to be faithful to you. So that's on a micro level, that is in your own personal life, but also a macro level of the whole church. So we're gonna trust the Lord to provide. A few more announcements before we get into today's text. I was met this morning by a brand new friend of mine. He's 11 years old. His name is Keanu. Keanu, can you just wave at everyone? Keanu's right here. Are you 11 years old? Did I say that right? 11 years old, Keanu, and he's here with Janice. And they asked me on the, on the patio there, they said, hey, Keanu's only visiting for a couple days here. Is there any way he can get water baptized? And so I said, let's do it today at 2 p.m. So today we're doing 2 p.m. baptisms for Keanu. Can you all clap for Keanu? How exciting is that? Water baptism is when you believe that Jesus died on the cross. You believe it. You heard that. You're like, I believe Jesus died on a cross and he was buried, but he didn't stay buried. He rose from the dead and he came out of the tomb and he now ascended into heaven. And so you stand in the water, you're baptized, identifying with his burial and then coming up, identifying with his resurrection. Here's what I want to do. I want to invite that and extend that invitation to anybody who wants to show up today at 2 p.m. Nye Beach, we'll be baptizing Keanu. And if you haven't been water baptized, maybe today's the day that you'll join us in the water as well. So it's going to be a beautiful day. Join us there, celebrate. Thank you, Keon, for your faith and for your willingness to follow the Lord obediently. Also, another special announcement. Today is Doug Wilson, sitting right over there, my good friend, his last day at South Beach Church. Doug, would you just stand up real quick? Can we clap for you? I love you, Doug, so much. Doug, Doug has been with our church for over a decade now, and he joined us at the warehouse many years ago with Quimby and his three children and moved over here from Idaho, I believe it was. And as they moved over to seeing the church grow, and Doug and his family are relocating back to their home state, which is Montana. And so Quimby and the kids are already over there. And I'm just so grateful for Doug and the way he served our community, one of our doctors and surgeons in our area. And he's just been a blessing to me personally. So thank you, Doug. I love you very much. I respect you. Thank you for your commitment to God and his church as well. So we love Love you. Also, a couple other things are happening today. Today is, we're going to celebrate some birthdays. Can we do that? Is that okay? You guys remember Ramblin' Rod? You just, you just dated yourself, but that's okay. <laughs> Ramblin' Rod, what happened to that guy? Remember, he would celebrate the birthdays, and he had the pins, and everyone had a birthday. Today is Chelsea and Jeremiah's birthday today. <laughs> today is Megan's birthday. Tomorrow is Megan's birthday. Tomorrow is Patty's birthday. What? Randy's birthday, her husband. You can celebrate for him. And tomorrow is my mom who's watching online at home. Her birthday is tomorrow, Grandma Arla. So thankful, so thankful. My mom's actually home taking care of my dad. He's got a, a painful a, a gout has kind of flared up. So pay, pay, pay for Joe. It's terrible, terrible stuff. So her birthday's tomorrow. We're gonna go to lunch. My sister's coming down from Beaverton. So we're going to sing. I love you guys so much. Hey, did I miss anybody? Whose birthday is it out there? You're, when? Wednesday. Wednesday. Shannon's birthday on Wednesday. Anybody born? Anybody have a birthday this year? <laughs> When's your birthday? Yesterday. <laughs> We're gonna sing happy birthday to everyone. Okay, that's how it's gonna go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to everyone. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. Ah, so, so fun. Hey, grab your Bibles now. Mark 6. I think we got through the announcements okay. Everyone, everyone's still with us. Love to celebrate what God's doing in our community. Truly, God has blessed us. 
Uh, people have been asking me about our vacation. We flew to Kauai and stayed over there in a house in the Poipu side, the south side. And, and we also met up with some people, some real good friends of mine, Sherry and Brett, live in Kona. And they flew over and met us there and they renewed their vows, 25 year anniversary. Brett used to be the manager here at Starbucks. So he's one of my favorite people in the whole world. And, um, and so we, we got a chance to fellowship with them. We actually ran into them on the island three or four times. It was so special. And then on Sunday, we went to Calvary Chapel, uh, Kauai, right there in Lihu or Lihue, however they say it. I can't pronounce all the things. And we had a wonderful time with Joey Roper and his wife and three kids and fellowshiped over there. And so the body of Christ is everywhere. We drove up to the North Shore where Jason Beal used to be a pastor up there and met some other folks and such an honor. But I love you guys so much and I miss you. And what a joy to be here on the Oregon coast for such a time as this. And the Lord's leading us and guiding us. And we have people visiting and people showing up and people cheering us on. And I'm doing the same for each and every one of you. So let's pray now before we get into God's word and ask his word to be alive to us, to minister to us, to do for you and for me what we could never do for ourselves or for anybody else. It's the word of God, the logos. It's the rhema word, the spoken word of God. Let's pray and ask him to do those things in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship, for the kingdom here, Lord, on the island and everywhere around and Lord, in Coos Bay and Calvary and Lebanon and all over, we thank you, Jesus. And we thank you for the Oregon coast. We pray, Lord, that your word, Lord, would be our attraction, that it would be, Lord, our affection, that it would be our desire. Lord, the Bible says in the Proverbs and the Psalms that your word is more precious than honey or gold or silver. Lord, I would confess at times, Lord, I really like honey and gold and silver. And so we want your word, Lord, to be more valuable to us. So would you change us again today? Maybe you're here this morning and you need a miracle, a supernatural intervention of God, a reconstruction of a relationship, or maybe it's something in your body needs adjusted or healed or fixed and you're desperate for the king's touch. Lord, would you do that as we submit ourselves to your word and to your spirit and your kingdom? Thy will be done. We plead your mercy and grace over this time. Now, would you give anointing both for me to speak and anointing for all of us to hear? In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Hey, check this out. Let's read the last couple of verses that Pastor Rory ended with. Look at verse 41. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven. And he blessed and he broke the loaves and he gave them to his disciples to set before them the two fish that he divided among them all. And so they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish and, no, the, and those who had taken the loaves were about, eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. What a day this must have been. You know leading up to this day that they were about to go to Kauai themselves. Remember, they were gonna take a little vacation, remember? And, and, and John the baptizer had just been murdered and the disciples told Jesus. Not only did they tell Jesus about his cousin who'd just been killed, but they also just got done with a tour of ministry. Remember, they were sent out two by two and with power, they were doing crazy things. These guys were on the grind and on the go. And yet in the middle of that, 5,000 people showed up. So they served him. You'll remember in the study there, the disciples were duplicitous in their mindset. They were divided. They just wanted to go take a break. Nothing wrong with that. But Jesus had compassion like a shepherd. And he saw all the people. He's like, guys, we'll take a break in a minute. But can we feed the people first? Uh, if we have to. Uh, and they began to complain. Just send them away. We don't have enough resources. And Jesus let them process verbally. And he blessed them and fed them. This is crazy. This would have been so nuts. Five loaves and two fishes. They just do what I say. We have an acronym here at South Beach Church. It's called DTNRT. Do the next right thing. And then TTP, trust the process. And in this text, doing the next right thing was making people sit down in groups of 50 and 100, taking the five loaves and two fish. This is not enough, Jesus. But he said, feed the people. And they began to feed the people. They were doing the next right thing, trusting the process. And all of a sudden, there was more than enough for this row, and, and that row got fed, and well, this row's getting fed, and that row and this row. And by the time they were done, you'd think they'd be completely extinguished and exhausted, but instead they have 12 baskets full of fragments, one for each disciple. Man, Jesus, the master teacher. Wouldn't you have been satisfied if everybody ate except the disciples? If that's how the story went, I would have bought it. I'd be like, totally, dude, those guys deserve to go to bed hungry. <laughs> I would have loved that, but Jesus fed every single person that he loved like a shepherd. 
Sometimes you and I in our own smallness and weakness, we look at the needs of our local community or even the needs of your family or the needs of the people shopping there at grocery outlet. Ah, oh, too many people, too many people. And the Lord says, why don't you go love them? Well, I don't have enough even for myself. And the Lord says, the enough for yourself is hidden in blessing other people. It's better to give than it is to receive. This is a command. It's a challenge. It's a step of faith that every single day we have to take. Jesus actually said something enlightening in John 4. When he had poured himself out, he was hot, tired, and hungry, and he sent the boys to Subway to get some footlong sandwiches. And remember, they came back with the footlong sandwiches, and they said, hey, Jesus, here's the food you ordered. And he says, I'm not hungry anymore. And they got mad, John 4, and they said, who fed Jesus, you know? Who's been feeding this guy? And he says, no, no, my food, my meat, is to do the will of him who sent me. I'm actually full because I'm doing what God asked me to do. Wow. Well, here in this story, these disciples have 12 baskets full. <sighs> but as we're gonna see in the next portion of the story as it unfolds, that provision of bread, how many of you guys think a provision of miraculous bread is legit? Who wants that in their life? I wanna see this. It actually produced not faith in their lives, and we don't know why, we'll see in a minute, but hardness of hearts. At the end of the day, they had all this bread, but they are just still kind of frustrated. So you know what Jesus does next? Read with me. I wanna set the tone and set the stage. Verse 45, Jesus the master teacher now is going to, like a master teacher, test his pupils. If you've ever been to school before, you know you get taught a lot of things. Read this book, listen to that person, watch this video, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm just kidding. That's how I approach school, <laughs> sorry. They teach you. But if they're a good teacher, at the end of the teaching will come a test. Make sure you listened. Isn't that the scariest part of school? Pop quiz, ah! Jesus now, wanting to be the best teacher possible, tests his pupils. Look at verse 45, let's read a few verses. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening had come, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. And then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. And now about the fourth watch of the night, that's 3 a.m., he came to them walking on the sea, and he would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and they cried out. And when they saw him, they were troubled. But immediately he talked with them, and he said to them three things, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And then he went up into the boat to them and the wind ceased and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Stop right there, ice up here. The feeding of the 5,000 is included in all four gospels. It's an important story. This particular story after that is included in Matthew and Mark. Jesus has already been with the disciples once in a storm as the boat almost went down, but he was in the boat sleeping with them. We remember that from Mark chapter five as they were going to the shores of Gadara. Now they're in another storm. How many of you guys have found yourself going from one storm to another storm before you figured this out yet? You guys live on the Oregon coast, it happens. And you get through a storm like, dang, that was a doozy, that was crazy, ah, another storm. Well, this storm's a little bit different. Jesus is not with them this time. I really want us to freak out. I don't know what kind of storm you're in right now. I don't know what kind of experiences you're having. Maybe you're just a few steps before the storm. Maybe you're in that point of provision and five loaves and two fish multiplying and it's a good day. You're having a great time. We're gonna call this mountaintop versus valley low. Mountaintop high, valley lows. In your life, you're either having a mountaintop high or you're having a valley low or you're in between one of the two, period. And in the mountaintop highs, don't we love it? The vistas and the revelation and the views. Like, ah, we love that. You can see everything. But you'll notice in those seasons of our life, not a lot of growth happens. As a matter of fact, if you go to mountaintops, they don't grow fruit in mountaintops there's no harvest going on there, no fields, no vineyards. The vineyards and the fields and the fruit, they're down below in the valley. That's where the growth happens. And as much as I like mountaintop experiences spiritually when I see things and I am revealed things and I'm growing in things, the Lord says, hey, let's go to the valley now. Why are we gonna do that? Well, because the valley's where the roots are attached. 
and the fruits are grown. And in the storms of life, down lower, that's when we become, listen, the men and women God wants us to be. You need both. You need valleys and mountaintops. And they've just had, in my opinion, a mountaintop experience. Five loaves and two fish. This is crazy. And maybe they're hooting and hollering, this is crazy. This is crazy. Jesus like, get in the boat. Like, okay, he sounds stern, you know. As a matter of fact, verse 44, I think it's where we started, is at verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitudes away. In the Greek there, it's urged them seriously. Guys, get in the boat. Maybe they weren't listening. Get, I said get in the, did I st- get in the boat and start rowing? I would have had questions. Jesus, are you going with us? No, I got more questions. Why not? What are we doing? It's late. It was already late in the day before they fed the 5,000. This was way late. This might be a bad idea, and yet Jesus, master teacher, now testing, valley time, sends them out. Guys, you go, I'll go take care of the crowds, okay? I'll take care of them. You took care of them earlier. I'm gonna send them away now, but I want you guys to get into the boat and start rowing. See, Jesus knows exactly what you and I need. He does give us times of refreshment and times of revelation and vision. Oh, do not be surprised, though, if immediately afterward there is a testing to galvanize the vision, the truth of God's word that he's given to you. Dare I say it differently, to refine it and to make it pure, that you would own it, that it wouldn't just be somebody else's revelation that you heard, but it would be yours that you own. Because as the storms of life come, God uses those storms to produce in us greater fruit and deeper roots As a matter of fact, they've done studies over the years of how important storms are. If you're like me, you would vote for more days in Hawaii, less storms. That's what we want. The Lord says, no, you need vacations and rest, but you also need storms. Remember back in the 1990s when they built the biosphere in Arizona, the biosphere one and the biosphere two, and they created this utopian environment. It was perfect and it was protected. There was no outside pollutants and no outside involvement. And it was a scientific experiment. They created this place. It was a biodome and inside it was perfect. The weather was perfect and the water, the temperature, the humidity, the oxygen. And guess what happened in that study? Everything died. Everything went weird as the study, like, what the heck is going on? Not only did everything die and mutate and get weird, but even the people living in there, they started to fight more. They didn't like each other. As a matter of fact, one of the things they learned, which is pretty obvious, but also nonetheless worth noting, is that as the trees began to grow in this perfect environment, the trees began to grow, but then they began to lean over and they would die. They grew quickly, but they died. And they said it was because of, quote, lack of stress. Now, stress is bad, right? You guys hate stress? Your doctor says, you need to stress less. I'm like, get away from me. You know? like, they died because of lack of stress. There wasn't the wind in our lives. The wind in a tree's life is designed to do a lot of things. And when a tree is blown this way and doesn't die and blown this way and doesn't die, the tree bark and the tree fibers crack under that stressful condition. And you know what the tree does? It decides to keep going. It repairs itself, and it strengthens itself, and it shoot, it's, I gotta shoot the roots deeper. That was a crazy storm, and the roots go a little bit deeper, and another stressful season comes, and the tree continues to grow, and as the tree gets bigger naturally, it doesn't then topple under its own weight. What a cool design of God, isn't it? He says, hey, you know what? You don't like windy storms or droughtful summers. When there'll be a drought in a tree's life, it's forced to find the water. And I'm gonna die if I don't go deeper in this thing. I feel like this is the last days. So too in our lives, God says, a few storms in your life, in my principle, with my grace and my mercy and my favor and my plan are good for you. Now, I'm not saying we should live a high stress life and go crazy and not use wisdom and counsel and all of those things. But I would say this, Father knows best. And he looks at his boys now who have a basket full of food and they've seen his provision. And maybe they have a little bit of a cocky attitude. I'm not sure if they're having a hyper spiritual supernatural day. Can you imagine if you just performed this miracle? Like, hey, 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 look at my basket. You know, look at this. I fed all these people. And the Lord's like, get in the boat. I'll be over here. Where are you going, Jesus? I'm gonna go pray. I'm gonna go pray. I like how Jesus, by the way, takes these crowds and dismisses them. Okay, guys, that was awesome. Go home now. Wouldn't you be tempted, possibly, especially if you're in the ministry, 20,000 people show up. You're like, hey, let's go ahead and build a building and stay right here. This is pretty rad. Jesus loved the people, but he wasn't addicted to the crowds. That wasn't his mission. 
And I think it's important to note that in our ministries as they grow numerically, that's, that's God's favor, it's God's deal, and maybe a ministry doesn't grow numerically. It has nothing to do with how many people are there, but that people are there. And Jesus ministers to them. He knows it's not a good spot for them to stay the night, so he ushers them away. We learn from that. And he goes away, verse 46, and when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Ah, don't we love Jesus in his prayer life? So convicting that the Son of God would pray. He prayed so much that the disciples one day stopped him and they said, hey, Jesus, would you teach us to pray? Like, we're not doing the same thing you are. And if the Son of God had all the power of heaven, he prayed, how much more so do you and I need to repent and to try our best by the Spirit's help to pray more? To pray every single day. MC Hammer said, you gotta pray just to make it today. I think he had it right. You just gotta pray, keep going. Well, what is Jesus praying for on the mountain? We don't know. We could guess a few things. Maybe he's praying thanksgiving to God for the miracle that just happened. Maybe Jesus, being 100% man and 100% God, is in that cleft of the rock saying, that was so cool, Father. Thank you for doing that. Man, you provided. It's important, by the way, for us when God blesses us financially or in any way just expands the borders of our tents to spend some time in prayer. Thank you, Lord. I have a 2008 uh, Tundra, and, and I love it. I'm so thankful for that car because I've driven a lot of other cars that are uh, less reliable. And as I drive this car and it fires right up and start, don't you just love God's, and I just thank God for the simple blessings. Thank you, Lord, for a car. That's so cool, I appreciate that. I've had times where I didn't have a car. Thank you, Lord, for clothes or for a house, or thank you, Lord, for there's food in my fridge. Thank you. May we always be quick to thank God for the blessings. Maybe that's what Jesus was praying for, I don't know. Maybe he was praying for wisdom for what's next. He's two years into his three-year ministry. He's approaching his near death. He knows death is coming at this time in Mark chapter six. Maybe he's saying, Lord, you've been faithful. Keep me soft towards your spirit. Keep me right where you wanna be. And I would say it's important for you and I in our transitional seasons of our life too. Lord, let us have your wisdom. I love the prayer of Solomon where Solomon was about to be the leader of the children of Israel and he said, Lord, give me wisdom to lead your people well. What a cool prayer. And I don't know who you're leading. Maybe it's just me, myself, and I. Maybe it's you and your, your spouse or your family. Maybe it's a business. Give me wisdom. Maybe he was praying, not just those two things. Maybe he was praying for his buddies in the boat. How many of you guys think he was praying for the disciples? I guarantee you he was praying for the disciples. He sent them into the boat and they began to row. We read the story. About 3 a.m., he sees them rowing and they're straining against the wind. And I promise you, he's praying for them. Praying for them, not just so that they make it to the other side. How many of you guys ever just pray that simple prayer? Lord, just get me to the other side. And the Lord's like, I'm gonna get you to the other side. I would even say that the Lord doesn't really care about getting you to the other side because that's already a done deal. The Lord's more interested in what's gonna happen along the journey in your college or in your marriage or in your ministry. Lord, I just wanna finish this project. I just wanna get to the end of this. I wanna run my race well. And I was like, dude, I promised you we'd get to the other side. Don't worry about those big things, but pay attention to the little things I'm teaching you right now. God is probably praying that their hearts wouldn't fail, that they would be encouraged that the tests that come their way, because man, we don't necessarily like tests, we don't enjoy tests, we try and avoid tests, we skip the tests, we get all messed up in the tests, and yet Jesus here is praying for them that the test would produce fruit. The tests of our life are interesting, aren't they? They get more complex as we get older. When you're real young, the tests are real small. Like when you're a three-year-old and somebody forgets to cut the crust off your peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and you're being tested that day. Lord, have mercy on everybody. You know, it's just, and you're a little kid, I love, I love kids how the tears are right there, just red, locked and ready to go, and they can cry, anything. And it's just, they're the kids, that's all their capacity. As you get a little older, the tests get more sophisticated. You go to the first day of school and middle school, and you show up, and somebody else is wearing the same shirt you're wearing. <laughs> you know, your identity's being tested. And after college, you're older now and you graduate with a degree, but you don't want to go to work and you're being tested. Call your mom and dad, can I live with you guys? You know? and, and the tests, and they increase though, but as you get older, they just, they increase. And Jesus here, I believe, is increasing the test because the first time he was with them in the storm, remember that? He was sleeping and they're rowing, they're rowing and the water's coming in, they're looking at Jesus like, why is he sleeping? Finally, they yell, Jesus, wake up! And Jesus wakes up and calms the wind and says, what's your guys' problem? Like, uh, we're dying don't want to die today. And Jesus said, I told you we were going to the other side. Didn't that my word enough for you? I said, get in the boat, we're going to the other side. It was clear. Was the storm real in the first battle? Was the wind real? Was it real in this battle? It, it is real. 
and we freak out sometimes, and the Lord wants us to grow. As a matter of fact, I already read it to you, but those three words of encouragement he gives to them, three specific words, be of good courage, be of good cheer. It's me, don't be afraid. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. These are powerful statements that God gives to you and to me through his word in times of deep waters, dark days. I would love to say that, yeah, it wasn't that bad. Storm wasn't raging that big. No, it was. These are seasoned fishermen. Those who know the Galilee region know that these storms can creep up quickly and these waves are real and those boats weren't made for seas like this. And so they're crying out, straining, but Jesus is it's submitting them, do I, dare I say, to all this on purpose, praying for them. It says he departed to the mountain to pray. As a matter of fact, I got a few pictures. Dave, can you throw those up there, or Jessica? These are some pictures I took uh, of Mount Arbel. This is where most people believe where Jesus was uh, clefted into the rock there, praying for the Sea of Galilee, which is directly to the right. The next picture might show, not that one. There's another cleft of the rock, but to the right, there's the Sea of Galilee. That's me, believe it or not, back in 2007. And that's the Sea of Galilee down below. And many believe this is where Jesus, same day, jacket on, many believe that this is where Jesus was praying when he saw the boys uh, rowing. I'm gonna read the next verse to you. You can turn the lights back on. Thanks, Dan. It says in verse 47, now when evening had come, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. Stop right there, ice up here. Again, Mark writing this details what it was like. They were in the sea, in the middle, and Jesus was alone on the land. It feels very distant, doesn't it? And sometimes you and I can feel we're distant from the Lord. You can even feel disconnected, especially in our storms. I can't speak for you, but I can only speak my own experiences. When I'm going through a testing time, a storm, oftentimes I wonder, Lord, where are you? Based on my circumstances, Lord, if you were real, if you were in my life, then it wouldn't be going this way. The doctor wouldn't be calling me for more tests. I wouldn't be looking at my finances, stressing and sweating. Where's the money gonna come from? I wouldn't have this interpersonal conflict with my kids or my friends. Lord, where are you in this storm? Where's Jesus in this picture? He's distant, but listen, he's not disconnected. I say that to say this. We're made for connection. He designed us to be connected to him. And when that connection, whether vertical or horizontal is challenged. When the devil comes along in your life and challenges your connection to your spouse or to your kids or to your friends, have you ever had your connection to your spouse or your kids or your friends challenged by the enemy? You ever had the connections wrestled with and attacked vertically? And when those connections are challenged, we're tempted then to do weird things. We get out of balance and out of control real quickly. And here's the deal though, you and I need to have roots deep enough and fruit strong enough that during those times where you feel disconnected, you feel distant, it's going to happen, that you know, yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are, what, with me? In the valley of the shadow of death? Even in the presence of my enemies, you prepare a table before me? Enemies? Valley, death, the Lord's right there with you and the provision is for you. Now again, I say that because I am so quick to spaz out. You guys ever freak out? Feel like everything's against you, no one's for you, it's all stacked up on you and you start to get weird in your mind and the Lord would say to you, you know where I'm at right now, Luke? I'm looking at the situation, praying for you. That should bring comfort to your heart. That should bring encouragement to you in the battle. Lord, would you stop the storm? Would you stop the battle? No, I'm not done yet. I'm still doing stuff. You'd be like right in the middle of a workout. You ever gone through a workout before you're right in the middle? You're like, I don't wanna do this anymore. I don't wanna do this anymore. I wanna quit. I wanna go away. And I'll tell you what, you need accountability and you need fortitude and you need commitment to keep going to the end of whatever situation you're walking through right now, knowing Jesus is not disconnected from you. He might be distant, but through the spirit of God, he's connected to each and every one of us. Again, the first storm, he's right in the boat. Probably be preparing them for this one. Okay, guess I'm not gonna be in the boat this time, but I'll be over here. <laughs> anyway, you can just be in the boat with us, bro. What the heck's going on here? Did you know that Jesus knew better? He knew that just a year from now, he would die, raise from the dead, and ascend into heaven. And he would say to them, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. 
Remember, Jesus was the first one to say it. Arnold took it after that. He would say, I'll be back. I'm leaving now. Holy Spirit is with you. And they argued and protested. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I got some ideas for you to do, Jesus, down here. He says, no, no. You're gonna receive my power and you'll be my witnesses. You're gonna go on mission. You're doing this now without my physical presence. We understand that because that's all we've ever known. We've never had the physical presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. We've never had the privilege like the 12 disciples did. They didn't know that and they were learning. You know what we can do? All things through Christ who strengthens me. I can get through this. I don't have to spaz out. I don't have to quit. I don't have to like what I'm going through right now either. I don't think they enjoyed this little cruise. You know, they were rowing furiously. But they didn't have to spaz out. And I wanna get to a point in my Christianity in my journey, my mission, my ministry, where I spend less days spazzing out. I wish I could tell you that Pastor Luke Frechette just has no days of spazzing out anymore. And no emails freak me out and no meetings leave me tipped over and no relationships are stressing me out so much where I am experiencing high blood pressure. No, 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 I wish I could say I'm just good to go. But the Lord says, no, we're gonna keep working on that. But I want you to know that even though I'm distant, I'm not disconnected. I'm right here praying. We see all that. We learn all that here. Look at verse 47. It says, now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea. He was alone on the land. And then he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. Sometimes in our lives, we feel that that's how it is. Everything is against us. Did you know that even in our efforts, if you don't feel like you're moving forward, the Lord doesn't judge you by the way that you've moved forward. But he does judge, he does weigh your efforts. Sometimes you might say to yourself, I've tried so hard to salvage this relationship. I've tried so hard to start this ministry. I've tried so hard and the Lord might look at you and say, I know, you're doing great. What's that? Come again? It doesn't look like it's resolved. It's not producing fruit yet. And the Lord says, I'm the one who brings the increase. I'm the one who heals. I'm the one who, I've asked you to be faithful and to be faithful with the little things. Because we can give ourselves a big pat on the back when things are awesome and growth is evident and people are seeing things. And then we give ourselves not a pat on the back when it feels like we're just rowing. Lord, this is just hard. And the Lord says, I know, isn't this awesome? Remember in Acts 18, where Paul is in Corinth and he's in Corinth there. And the Bible says that Jesus ministers to him in the middle of the night, shows up and says, Paul, you're doing such a great job. Previously to that, he'd gotten kicked out of the synagogue and riots were starting and all this bad stuff. And Jesus says, you're doing great, Paul. He's like, you got the right Paul? I think, I don't know. And Jesus encourages him and says, just keep doing it. There's many people in this town that aren't saved yet. I know what I'm doing. Later on in Paul's journey, he would be in jail in Jerusalem, blood all over his face. Nobody liked him. Everybody hated him. Nobody knew what was going on. And Jesus showed up to him in the middle of the night and says, you're doing so good, Paul. (laughs) And this is how the Lord would use his word to you and to me also. In a world that is not our home, this world is broken. It's meant to unravel and fall apart. It's got an expiration date on it. And sometimes we wonder, why isn't it resolving and working and healing? And the Lord says, hey, leave that to me. I've asked you to DTNRT, do the next right thing, and to TTP, trust the process. When I say trust the process, I don't mean mine or your or our process. I mean his process. He's gonna do what he's gonna do. Here Jesus sees them. The wind was against them. Oh, look at verse 48 in the middle. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and he would have passed them by. I love our savior so much. I don't know if he's doing the moonwalk. I don't know if he's doing the truffle shuffle. I don't know what he's doing. He's walking super calm. I don't know. He's, this is a storm. How would you walk on a storm? Would you walk calmly by the boat and like kind of ignore it? <laughs> what, a, what a guy. Jesus does this, and I think he's demonstrating calmness because they probably needed somebody in the mix at that point to like look super calm. Because sometimes every, you look around your staff, or you look around the people that you live with or the community or the country we're in, everyone's got chicken little syndrome and freaking out. And I believe God's called Christians that know the truth, know the end from the beginning, we win. He's asked us to be calm in the storm. Just do the next right thing. Trust the Lord. Yeah, but it's time to freak out. It's time. To, you'll never see in the Bible Jesus running or freaking out. They killed him when he was 33. If anybody should run and freak out, it's him. But he doesn't. And I want to be just like that. He, he's calm. Here's another thing. He walks in the Bible says, Mark just puts this in. Matthew doesn't say it this way, but Ma- Mark says that he would have just walked by. I don't know what this is about. Was Jesus ignoring them? Or 
I believe what he was doing is giving them an opportunity in this moment to cry out to Jesus and to invite him into their boat, into their storm. I would write the story differently. I would have Jesus running out there, jumping over waves, doing a little trick, jump right into the boat, boom, and then calm the seas. Jesus to the rescue. Ah, oh, yeah, it was great. Don't you want Jesus just to crash into your boat and fix everything? That's what I want. Jesus, you know, he knows my address. He'll crash into, no, he doesn't do that. Instead, he walks by, giving them an opportunity, or dare I even say it this way, giving an opportunity for their hearts to be exposed if they truly want him or not. Here's what happens. When we get tested every single day, when we get challenged, when we get shook, our wants come alive. I want something. And the idol of our heart is revealed in that moment. What do you want in that moment? Well, I want relief. I want recognition. I want comfort. I want answers. I want to be away from this, et cetera, et cetera, fill in the blanks. Take this for a spin this week. See how many wants show up on the throne of your heart. We'll call it rival kings, lesser thrones. Paul Tripp, who writes books and is a pastor, says that along with another guy in New York, I can't remember his name right now, that our hearts are idol factories, that we're constantly producing new idols, new wants, new things that will serve our needs at any given test and time. And I believe Jesus is saying, what do you guys want right now? Do you want relief? Do you want rescue? Or do you want me? Do you want me? And I would say to you and say to myself as well, I wanna get to the point in my Christian life where every single test I go to prayer. Not just prayer, but I go to trust. Lord, I trust that you're gonna get me through this because if you're honest, there are things that creep up in your life. I just wanna escape right now. And there are ways to escape, ways to process in our life that are good, that are God given to us with exercise and, and journaling and reading or rest or counseling. Those are good ways to process. But sometimes you'll notice that there are some areas in your life that get exposed during this time. I just wanna escape. I don't wanna deal with this anymore. It's too much going on. I just wanna escape. You could do this through drugs or through alcohol or through pornography or other things that will destroy your life. We're all prone to these temptations. And I believe Jesus on purpose is availing himself to them. I'm right here. Are you gonna invite me into your boat? Wouldn't it be rad if every single day we said, dude, I feel tested today. I feel thin. I feel like I'm wasting away. I'm gonna go spend some time in his word. I'm gonna spend time in fellowship. I'm gonna find some believers right away because I feel like I'm in a dangerous spot. I don't wanna go to those old areas, those old addictions. You guys ever been addicted to anything before? Just me and three people? Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> I've been addicted. As a matter of fact, I was thinking this through last night. I remember when I realized I was addicted to cigarettes. In 1997, I began to smoke cigarettes. 1996, I began to dabble when I was a teenager and I began to smoke and I actually went to the church here and I remember there was a, a service we had here. My dad had me work with him and we ministered to people. I was part of the youth group, I was a little older, but we served and when I left, I was so stressed out from the whole event, I got in my car and I lit up a cigarette. And I remember that day because the way the cigarette made me feel, ah, relief, ah, finally comfort and calm. And I realized, whoa, I'm addicted to these suckers. Now, relief and comfort and calm, those are all good things. Someone say amen. Where you get those things from, though, is going to be evident of where your wants are. What's the most important thing to you? Jesus will allow storm after storm after storm after storm after storm after storm after storm in your life to refine your faith, to make it more pure, but also to expose those other illicit areas where you're finding calm and comfort and relief. I say that with no shame. I'm right there getting my faith refined every single day. And I wanna be quick to cry out, Lord, help me. Lord, would you come into my boat? <clears throat> Interesting to me, Jesus walks by as if he would have just kept going. And then it says, I gotta keep going here, man. This is so good. And when he saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and they cried out for they all saw him and were troubled. Stop right there, eyes up here. This word ghost is only used in the Bible twice. Here, and in Matthew 14 for the same story. It's the word phantasma. It's where we get our word phantom from. I just say that because it's freaking me out. How many of you guys think these disciples didn't actually believe in ghosts? They don't believe in ghosts. I don't think they believed in ghosts. But when they saw Jesus in the storm, they began making crazy stuff up. They began thinking things that they didn't think previously. Now, I don't wanna go too deep in this, but when you're in a test, when you're in a storm, you start believing false things. 
You start saying things that aren't true. We've all experienced this. Man, this is crazy, and, and that person's crazy, and, that, and that's happening, and that's happening, and in reality, probably none of that's happening. You're in a test. You're in a storm. You've been deceived. You've been tricked. These guys are like, it's a ghost! I promise you they didn't believe in ghosts. But I've done enough counseling with people in situations where it's hard. This is a really messed up situation. People lose loved ones. Mental health is real. Problems happen. And all of a sudden, if you're not careful, you can come up with the wrong scenario, the wrong conclusion of a real situation. So what does Jesus do? This is what you and I need to do. They think it's a ghost. I wonder if Jesus is tired of laughing. Really, a ghost? Okay, didn't know that was a thing. Verse 49, no, it goes on, but immediately he talked with them. And he said to them, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. What did Jesus do when they started coming up with false conclusions and weird reality checks? Immediately, Jesus begins to talk and he gives them three commands. Be of good cheer. It's me. Don't be afraid. We're gonna summarize this so succinctly. When they began to trip, when they began to get unhinged, when they were imbalanced, when they were tested, the word of God came to them immediately and it began to give them comfort and give them light. The Bible says of itself that thy word is a lamp for my path and a light for my feet. My feet, it, the word of God leads us and guides us. Can I just remind you at South Beach Church here that we are people of God's word? I saw somebody, I think it was John Smith, grabbing the August five by five reading series. It's right around the corner there. It'll help you get through the New Testament and the Old Testament if you don't know where to read. When I was in Kauai the other day, the other day, a couple, last week, I committed to reading through First and Second Corinthians. I just wanted to read the Bible and every single day just reading through the scriptures. And as I did, grounding myself, reminding myself of the truth, lest I think everyone around me is a ghost, lest I think everything around me is not true. The word of God renews our mind, renews our passion, shows us what to think, what to be. And notice the three things he says. Number one, be of good uh, cheer. Be of good cheer, literally be encouraged, which is the opposite of discouraged. Have you guys ever been discouraged before? Easy. Every single day, you can look at the news, you can look at gas prices, you can look at yourself in the mirror, you can look around, oh, I'm just so discouraged. And what God says to us, it's a command, be encouraged, full of courage. Courage in the face of fear is the ability to listen to God in the midst of your fear. Wouldn't it be radical if there was no more fears, no more challenges in your life? That's not going to happen. But instead, courage is the ability to hear God above your fears. Secondly, he tells them, why should we not be afraid? He says, it's me. I'm right here with you. You guys know that when Jesus left, he said, it's better for you that I leave. The Holy Spirit's gonna be with you. Like, you're gonna be hooked up. I'm limited in my flesh. I can only be in one place at a time. But when I leave, the Holy Spirit's gonna be everywhere. Oh, you know what I love is reading the scriptures. And when you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're about to be thrown into the fire. They're like, we don't care. Do it. We're not gonna bow down. We're not worried. When you see David and Goliath, he's like, I don't care. I'll take that guy out. I'm not afraid. When you see Elisha with the Syrian army in 2 Kings 6, he's like, I'm not afraid. This is crazy. What are you guys talking? And you see these men of God and women of God, Deborah in the scriptures and Ruth, these men and women of God who aren't afraid of anything. Oh, I wanna be like that. Jesus says, hey, be of good cheer. It's me. And then he says, don't be afraid. Oh, wouldn't it be awesome again if we settled into God's word? And if you are fearful, you don't have courage and you don't know where God is, get into his word. Matter of fact, you have no excuses. If your mental health is failing, your relationships are messed up, if your commitment to God is under attack, you don't know what's going on, you have no peace in your heart. If you're not being in God's word every single day, don't, don't, don't call me. Don't call, don't complain. I say that not shamefully, but as a challenge to you and to me, God's already given to us our daily bread. He's given to us all things that pertain to godliness and righteousness in him. A couple more verses and we're gonna respond in a song and we're gonna sing. Then he went up into the boat to them and the wind ceased. Oh my gosh, stop right there, eyes up here. I don't even know how to say this, but I'll say it. In Matthew, there's a whole other part of the story that's not included in Mark. This is the part where Jesus says, be of good cheer, it's me, don't be afraid. Peter all of a sudden gets encouragement. We don't see it here. Peter's like, if it's you, then bid me to come out on the water. <laughs> the other 11 are like, did you just talk, Pete? What did you say? If it's, it, Peter gets emboldened by this word. Now, we don't know what Peter was thinking. It's one of my favorite miracles. Why would Peter go on the water? Why did Jesus let him go on the water? I don't know. Maybe it was this, though. Maybe he wasn't trying to show off. Maybe Peter heard Jesus' voice 
And he said, I would like to walk on water now because you're not in the boat and I just wanna be where you are. I'll do whatever, I'll get, I'll, I'll go, can I be with you? And Jesus, I don't know how far he was away, maybe here to the back door, he said, come on out. And Pete walked on water to Jesus Christ. You guys know the story. <clears throat> As he walked on this water, he began to sink. His eyes got off of Jesus and onto the variables and the surroundings around him, and Jesus saved him. Why is it not included in Mark's gospel? Two reasons I'll suggest. Peter dictated this story to Mark. Hey, write this stuff down. And then when Mark's writing it down, he's like, you want me to include that part where you walked on water and failed? <laughs> and maybe Pete's like, nah, Matthew already covered that. Just skip over that. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I don't know. It could have been he didn't want to draw attention to himself as the water walker. You know, like, ah, everyone knows that story. Just leave it out. You know, it's like, oh, the part where you sink. He's like, ah, whatever. I don't know. I don't know. My testimony, I've got lots of it. Sometimes I don't tell all of it, and he didn't tell his whole story here. Notice what it says here now as I lose my voice. This is what happens when you take a week off. You just lose your voice. Maybe somebody could get a, a brother some water. Tommy, got me a little glass of water. This is what it says here. It says, then he went into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. How did Jesus get up in the boat? On the waves. The waves were his steps into the boat. Think this through with me. Your life is full of waves, choppy situations, challenging circumstances. What if God says, that's actually how I'm getting into your life? That's how I wanna get into your boat. You mean, Lord, you can get into my boat through this cancer? Yep. You mean, Lord, you can get into this boat through this marital problem? Yep. You mean, Lord, I, you can get into my boat through this financial strain and the situation, through this struggle, and I feel like I'm just taking on water and things are going against me? And the Lord says, I know, I'm using that to get closer to you. This is not how I would write theology. I wouldn't write it this way. Lord, let my life become more difficult so you have more access to me. And eh, I'm not signing on that document. And the Lord says, that's exactly how I do it. Now, I can say that with boldness in a world gone mad, in a world promised difficulty. I want to be the Christian that when difficulty comes my way, I see it as an open door for the Lord to get closer into my life, to have more access to me. I'm going to have the worship team come up, and they're going to lead us in a song. Notice what it says, though, in the middle of verse 51. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. Stop right there. Eyes up here. Did you know that when the bread was multiplied, they weren't greatly amazed beyond measure and marveled? They were greatly amazed beyond measure and marveled after the storm. Let's just be Americans for a minute here. How many of you guys think that after a bread multiplication miracle, you would be greatly amazed and marveled beyond measure? You'd be the best person where I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed. No, it wasn't the blessing that brought their marvel, it was the storm. It was the difficulty. God gave them both. They had 12 baskets of food. But for some reason, and for some reason, their hearts were hardened after the provision. Their hearts were less close to the Lord. But when they went through crud, when they went through difficulty, and Jesus walked up the waves, they were marveled greatly amazed. Now, God is so gracious and so merciful to you and me. He does bless us. He gives us our daily bread. He doesn't withhold from us any good thing. But he also will commit to leading you through a storm or two in your life. He'll do it. He'll do it for your growth, for your faith, and for your relationship with him. I don't know what kind of storm you're going through right now. I can predict my storms. I can kind of see them on the future. I see what's happening every single day I wake up and I look in the mirror. Ah, um, it's me. You know, I'm my number one enemy. My biggest problem is me. And then I look down the list and the rest of them are right there. You know, I, I live with them, you know. That's a joke. You should not have laughed at that. Shame on you guys. Let's all stand. What we're gonna do during this song is I'm gonna stop talking because my voice is gone. And I got two more services. You can pray for that. Now I wanna give you an opportunity. You guys are all Christians. If you're not, you need to become one. And give your life to Jesus Christ today. Become a Christian. Yes, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. 
If you've already done that and you're a sinner that has been saved, today you need to simply repent with worship. You can come up to the platform, you can kneel down. I'll be over here praying for people. Maybe John and Lucy could pray for some people over here. A couple lines of people and just say, Lord, I'm in a storm. And maybe instead of praying for deliverance from the storm, which is not a bad prayer, we'll pray that too. But instead of praying for a lighter load, wouldn't it be awesome to pray for stronger shoulders? You only get one life. Have you freaked out about this? It's almost over. Even if you're young, it speeds up quick. It's almost over. Don't waste it. Don't waste any storm ever. Thy will be done. Lord, make me more like you. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, did you notice how I spazzed out in that storm? Man, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. I said some things, I did some things. My wants were exposed. I wanted relief and calm and comfort. I went to the wrong thing, Jesus. Ah! And the Lord says, hey, let's bury that. Let's bury that in the sea of forgetfulness. There is therefore now zero condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, Romans 8, chapter one. Lord, would you bless us now as we respond to you. Jesus, we love you and we repent. Every single one of us have mercy and forgiveness upon us and restore to us the joy of our salvation. Take us through this storm that we're in right now, Lord. Accomplish only what you could do. The boys tried their best. They rode their hardest. That's all you expected. May we do the same. But may you, Lord, be the master and commander of the storm. May you calm it even in our hearts today. We repent, Lord. Have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship the Lord together. If you need prayer, come on up.